Unfiltered, the official Sunderland AFC podcast. Hello and welcome to another edition of SEFC Unfiltered. I'm currently standing outside the huge square block of the Foundation of Lights building, the Beacon of Light. I'm going to go inside and speak to Sir Bob Murray, former chairman of Sunderland Football Club, who this week has released a book about his life, which of course includes a lot about his time at Sunderland Football Club. Danny's not here. He's away on international duty this week. It's a very grey day here in Sunderland, but there's always a warm welcome as I walk over the bridge up to the sliding double doors of the Beacon of Light. It's fair to say that Sir Bob has had an interesting life to date. It's going to be really interesting to hear some of those stories from Sir Bob in person. And just a reminder that all the proceeds from the sale of the book go directly to the Foundation of Light. Welcome to SCFC Unfiltered, Sir Bob Murray. Sir Bob, how are you? I'm very good, Frank. Are you? I'm well. You've had a busy week of promoting this book. Um, Have you enjoyed how busy you've been? Well, I've never done a book before, Frank, so it's been unique. uh, We've been to London and we've been to Yorkshire and we're now in Sunderland all week promoting it. Yeah. Uh, Fantastic interest in the book. Has been very encouraging. How how does it differ being a businessman and a man who's essentially trying to sell a book? Uh, you've got a busy day still, full of diary appointments, but I guess it's nice that you get to speak about your life. Yeah, it is. Uh, um, you know, the the book's been a long journey. It's uh, it, a lot of people have been asking me to do a book hmm. uh, for a lot of reasons, really. Uh, you know, I've had a colourful life. Uh, I've had an inspirational life as well highs and lows and uh you know in 2018 we actually started we got a great guy called Lance Hardy who's very well known amongst Sunderland supporters he was uh edited the match, match of the day and produced the match of the day very eminent man did Stoke 73 a lot of books and uh Leslie Callaghan introduced me to Lance and uh, we appointed him to write the book uh and then we went through a period of work uh, meeting all over the country, uh, putting a lot of effort and time in. Obviously, Lance was a, a Sunland guy, uh, not from Sunland, but a Sunland fanatic, and that made it a lot easier to cover the Sunland angles off. He wasn't a businessman, so that was a bit tougher. But uh, and, and then we had a really bad time. Uh, COVID came, and Lance uh, uh, had a brain tumour, and he stopped working. Uh, and died six months later. So it's been a, a tremendous journey for that. With we, you know, when you talk, we're doing a book. You talk about all kinds of things. You're very close. It's intimate. It's uh, very, very personal. And I loved the guy, and became very, very friendly. So he died, uh, and obviously, uh, Frank, we didn't continue then. We had a, 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 a period of stoppage, and then the we then decided to make the editor the writer. And carried on. So Lance had finished the book. It's a it's a massive book. It's uh, 400 pages, small typeset, 150,000 words. And as you know, every penny of the book, all 20 pound, goes to the Foundation of Light. And that's the other driver for the book because uh, this year is the fifth year of the Foundation of Light, and we'd like to make a surplus this year for the first time because we've been COVID and whatever since we opened the Beacon, and it's important to us to make a profit this year, a surplus. And so, obviously, we'd like to raise a six-figure sum uh, for the foundation. And uh, Henry, Henry Winter and all these people are raving about the book. So, uh, fingers crossed. Yeah, I mean, Lance has a good track record of making great books, hasn't he? And he's very well respected. Yeah. Uh, and when he passed, the likes of Gary Lineker, people like that were coming yeah, out and right, give Frankie. tributes to, to Lance Hardy and, yeah. and his work. What what is the process like when when writing a book? Then, so Bob, do you literally sit down with someone like Lance and does does he say, "Tell us about your first match. Yeah. Tell us about when you first took over some. Tell us about what happened on that day." How does it work? Well, we've worked the book from like when I was born. Uh, we haven't uh, jumped into the Premier League. How the Premier League happened as the first page. So it, it's been like uh, not always dateable, but it, most of it. So we've we've done that, and before Lance. 
past, we had the first book uh, in very rough draft because the, his illness did interfere with his work. So all these chapters, Lance's names for the chapters, and, and there's over 40 chapters, uh, and there's, there's, they fit in very nicely. So it, it's a, it, frankly, it's a clean piece of paper. There's, he, he doesn't have anything to go on. It's the first meeting was sat down with a, a tape and I think he's got about 180 tapes. And then he would just transcribe it yeah, from the he tapes? Did, he'd do the work. Wow, that's impressive. Um, it's been an experience because I've never been in literature before, and I've come across really nice people. Um, it's it's quite unique. that they, they, they don't do it for money. It's not like going to see a lawyer. It's uh, it's really nice. It's like a love. It's a passion. Yeah. It's been a really nice experience. We've, you know, we even had a great, a great, a great lawyer check it. He did it for nothing. Uh, because of the charity, and we've had uh, an editor, a publisher. Uh, it's been a real journey. Yeah, and was were you ever approached earlier in life to write a book? Because I'd imagine you saw some of your peers, like so Alex and you know other famous chairmen, making books and selling books. How how did you ever been approached before? No, I think you know, like it's not for money, uh, and, and so Frank, it it's like a legacy issue. Obviously, the charity money is vital. But it's been nice t- because a lot of people say it's a shame you lost your life. It'd be a shame because, you know, I had a, I, I, I had a council house upbringing, which I'm extremely proud of. Our family had no money. Uh, we're in a two up, two down. And I left school and I was unemployed for a year, you know. And, uh, and that's the story. So it's quite inspirational as well. Yeah, absolutely, and it makes perfect, you know, the 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 way it's written as well with the background of, the backdrop of Sunland Football Club and its ups and downs as well. It's really cleverly wrote, isn't it? Yeah. And we'll touch upon that as well as we discuss it. But I want to ask you, because this is for the fans of Sunland Football Club, about that first game. And I know you do mention it in the book, because I read the book, but tell us... A paint a picture of your first game at Roger Park, 1954, was it? Yeah, yeah the mid-50s. Tell us about it, because you didn't <coughs> live in Sunderland, you mentioned you lived in concert, didn't that's you? That's right, yeah. So that's like, you know, Durham way, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's about 25 miles away, but my dad was a Sunderland coal miner, he was silks with pit. He went down at 14, he didn't like being under the ground. So he moved to concert to get a, a work job at the steelworks. My mum's from Hortonley Spring, uh, you know, so I was the only one born in concert. So obviously when I was old enough to go to the game, my dad took me. And that happened to be when I was nine. It was the mid-50s, and we were playing Wolves at the time, and Wolves were the team at the top of the league with the great Billy Wright. And uh, I went in the ground, and like there's 50,000 faces there from a lad from the back streets of concert. And that's something you'll never forget. What, what can you remember about that day? What, what were the things that really struck you about being in Roker Park? Was it, well, what, what could you smell? What could you see? I could smell the cigarettes. Yeah. Uh, and I could smell the beer. Yeah. And it was a very male crowd. Yeah. A very adult crowd. But it, it was just just the faces. You, you know, my dad made a step, hung it over the railings, and uh, so I could stand on it and see over the camber at, Ro- at Rocky, you know. So, it, to ju- it, I mean, it's craggy. It was just all consuming. Would you say that. you fell in love on that day? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, I, I was always going to be a son and support. My dad had decided that. You know, so it was, it was it was a really great baptism. The score was nil nil. I thought they would won, but uh, that was the day I first saw my first game. And that that started a love affair, I guess, with with the club. And did you have any favourite players at that particular point? Who well, you... my dad loves Len Shackleton. He loved Len Shackleton, and I met later met Len, uh, who was a very eminent man. And he did a second book. He's very famous for his first book when he had a page with nothing in. And that's what football directors knew about football. And he was a, a writer in the press. And, uh, and uh, Michael Parkinson let him down doing the foreword for a second book. And I was chairman of Sunderland at the time and I had that honour. So, I, you know, my dad that day to see Shackleton, who was my dad's favourite player, and then to think that his son would knock the ground down. Yeah, <laughs> and one of the players you mention in the book that you were a big fan of when you watched Sunderland was Brian Clough. Yeah, was he the best Sunderland player you ever saw? And well, just how good was he? Well, obviously, um, Charlie Hurley was the one that um, I've uh, personally thought um, because of his loyalty. I think Charlie could have played for any team in Britain. He was that good, 
but he used to get on the bus with the fans from Ryab. So one of the first things I did when I became chairman, I befriended Charlie and his wife Joan, and I invite them to Sunland with their daughters, and the daughters couldn't believe the respect the crowd had for their dad. And he's a very, very nice gentleman, and we still have Christmas cards today. He's not in the best of health, but we still have Christmas cards. Brian Clough, uh, I met. I idolised Brian Clough. I was there the day he finished, and um, I uh, asked the uh, chairman of Nuts Forest if I could meet Brian. And so he invited me down to a, a cricket game at Nottingham in June one year. And uh, he took me into the forest ground to meet Brian. And it's June, remember, Frankie. And I went in and the office stunk of whiskey. <laughs> it's in the morning, you know. And his sister to me, he says, you are young. He says, I've heard all about you, you know. And then, so when Brian finished, we invited him to Sunland. And uh, he's charming, charismatic, and very entertaining with the ladies. But he, he'd sit, you know, he's finished really. Uh, but he'd sit next to me, four rows back from the front, and he'd shout to Peter Reid, change it, change it, you know. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, so all these great people, you know, Jacqueline Hurley, uh, you know, Clough, I had the great fortune to meet through being chairman of the club yeah there's a few themes in the book as well where your life seems to go full circle as yeah. being so, uh, idolizing someone that, and then you become that's peers very, with that's them very astute. and one of those people set the background particularly in the 60s was alan price you know and yeah. you were a fan of the animals and you you got into your music in in the yeah, 60s well, first, as well first record was don't let me be misunderstood by the animals yeah, and we had the big charity do at uh, Durham Cathedral. You did last year when and Alan came free of charge and played there, uh, and wow! Well, in fact, my life's been like that. Everything's come round in circles, you know. It, it comes round in circles. Uh, it starts with something and it hits me later. Do you think you you subconsciously have? some kind of drive to make that happen then because all these moments we were yeah, happening you know, in, I mean, in your younger life watching these players on the pitch and then becoming friends yeah, with you them. know even even uh, you know uh, my, my dad and mum bought me a bike at Millbrook and Sunland second hand shop for 12 quid and I had to cycle at the concert 20 odd years later I'm sat at Millbrook and Tom Cowie's office a couple of yards from the second hand shop I tell you you know would have thought that you know yeah. the, the whole thing you know Running run the first Great North Run yet, uh, Brendan Foster's a big friend of mine. Yeah. Now, or Saturday I'm out with Crammy. Yeah. You know, like it's it's just come back to us, Frank. I don't know why. It's like a boomerang. Yeah. Uh huh. It's great. Obviously, a very successful businessman, which got you into the position where you are now. We're yeah. going to touch upon it a little bit now. Uh, I loved the stories of the Perspex baths, yeah. and you know, then and ultimately moving on to the kitchen business yeah. uh, as well. And then you spoke, speak about, you know, the money started to come in and you were able to buy your first Porsche and the Mercedes and yeah. things like that. And was it ever at the back of your mind during that period when you were starting to accumulate a little bit of money that you would once own a football club? No. What, no, was, the, what was the goal then then, just to make the well, businesses just, as successful yeah, as possible? I've been really lucky in life and I became quite rich in 1983 and I wanted to give something back. And uh, so, you know, my dad died very young. So whenever we came up from Yorkshire, it just so happened, coincidentally, Sunderland were playing at home. And uh, so I'd, I'd heard in the press, which I means you shouldn't believe what's in the newspapers, but there were, there was, uh, the boardroom trouble at Sunderland was over. Uh, so I wrote to Tom Cowie and asked him if there's any way I, I could meet him to see if I could help the club in some way. So he asked me to come to Sunderland to see him at Millbrook. And... Uh, a couple of months later, he invited me to a game with my wife. We went, and uh, and then if a couple of weeks after that, if, if the result went OK, we'd get invited in the boardroom for a drink after the game. Uh, and then in 1984, in the June, he said he'd like me to sign a personal guarantee and join the board, uh, which, which I did. Uh, and that was quite an amazing experience, you know, because we were in the, what was the Premier League, uh, to be the Premier League. Yeah, first division, yeah. The first division, yeah. And, uh, you know, it, that was quite a an experience. So, um, the first year, we went to the League Cup final and got relegated. The next year, he brought in Laurie McManamy. Yeah. 
and that was Tom's big move because he always wanted a big name manager. You know, he tried for Brian Clough, uh, Bobby Robson, and he finally got Laurie to leave Southampton to come up here. Uh, and of course, it was an unmitigated disaster. So in 1986, um, it was just about to start the season and I think Tom had, at the end of the line then I, I think he'd had enough and he said to me, you, uh, you've got two choices, you can either leave the club or you can come up here with a chequebook now and buy my shares. Yeah. And that was in August 86. Just paint a picture as well of what was like at other clubs in the mid 80s, were they locally owned by successful yeah, businessmen every, every, nationally? There was uh, everyone. Yeah, so no, no, no overseas ownership no, or anything no, like no, that. No ownership, nothing. You know, when, when in '86, you see that was sweet because it was the opposite to when I went 2006, when I left. Um, in in '86, we knew all the players, the wives, the girlfriends. If they had a baby, they'd get a Christmas present. You know, I went to Marco Gabby Dini's wedding. That was the way we were. We were we were English. We were a club. Like a family almost. It was family. We, you know, somebody. Fell out with a girlfriend. We knew about it. You know, <laughs> it was it was an English club, and it it was really really nice. You know, uh, John McPhail's wife recently showed me a wedding present we'd got her. You know, it was just the, just the way it was. It was, but but f- football was at a low point then, Frank. It, yeah. It was archaic. It was badly run. Yeah. The stadiums were bad. The the foot hooliganism. Yeah. The whole thing was bad. We'll come on to some of those points. Were you able to pick up the phone and speak to the owners of other clubs at that point for help and advice? Or maybe just if you were going to play Manchester United the next week or whatever, would you normally speak to the chairman in the run-up and then sit yeah. with them on the match day? Well, I realised I haven't been to university about football. I played football but never got paid for it. So it's a new industry to me. And uh, obviously very competitive. And I can't control it for 90 minutes. So I, I, I befriended Liverpool... And I went over to see their very eminent chairman, John Smith, and Peter Robinson. And I went to Glasgow Rangers to see Sir David Murray. And I, I, I just was insatiable for knowledge and friendship to make friends, because not three o'clock on a Saturday, but after that. So I, I really put myself into it. It was an enormous effort to try to learn and make connections and relationships. Is it harder to be a chairman if you're a fan of the football club you're the chairman of? I couldn't imagine being chairman of a club I wasn't a fan of. So you're I saying you have to have a, a yeah, bit of love I, I, there? You, to... you can't do it. Yeah. You but but do nowadays, it. you know... Well, they do it for money, don't they? Yeah. You're looking at corporate bodies. Yeah. You know, it's, it, 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 I couldn't do it. You know, obviously, uh, we've got three clubs in the North East. You, you couldn't get a, a better example. We've got Steve Gibson who's irreplaceable. Still there, doing a good job, yeah, by all accounts. Yeah, but he's unre- irreplaceable. When Steve goes, th- that'll go, because there's nobody on side with the affluence or whatever to take his place. Uh, this Here where we've got a really modern ownership, uh, you know, and, and then we've got a state, a country. You know, so when you say you're a fan, is anybody up there fan? I don't know. I mean, um, it... it it, it's too expensive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I imagine on those days where you said that yourself, you, you've got no control of the 90 minutes when the, f- the fans are frustrated, and they were frustrated for a period of time during your yeah, tenure yeah. as well. And, and are you, are you going well. home th- with the same frustrations, thinking what that new signing just hasn't worked? What is the manager doing? And you're speaking to your wife about this on a Saturday evening. Are you the same? Are you just a fan? Well, well yeah, but Sue and I wouldn't speak for God, Peter. Oh really? We'd get, we'd do everything right, see the visitors away, make sure everything was okay, uh, and leave, and we wouldn't speak. It was just it was too big of a thing. It's it's everything. So you felt the relegation from with Laurie McManamy as much as the fans then, because oh, yeah. you are a fan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, you know, uh, you know, I cut my teeth on Laurie. my inheritance was Laurie McManamy because he had a contract we couldn't get rid of. Mm. You know, I had to pay him off when he agreed to a certain amount of money. Uh, I think I had Laurie from the beginning of the season till about March. Yeah. And then I brought Bob Stoke in, which was a lovely experience. Yeah, a legend at the uh, club, obviously. Yeah, yeah. The last 10 years, so much happened, really, you know, infrastructure-wise, Premier League status for a lot of them, the last 10 years of your tenure. 
I guess the infrastructure will be one of the main legacies you'll leave behind, obviously. Physical structures, you've got the Stadium of Light, the, the Academy of Light, and of course this building where we are recording this as well. Let's talk about the Stadium of Light first, because you inherited Roker Park. We then had Lord Justice Taylor recommend that all the, first, the top two divisions had to be seated stadiums, yeah, didn't they? So I'd imagine that became... One of your main missions, I well, guess, I was I to did. either yeah. change Roker Park if it was feasibly possible or then move to where we are now. So just yeah. tell us a little bit about that. I know it's all in the book, but for the fans listening, this report comes out and you know that yeah. Roker Park has to change, don't well, you? Well, when I took the chair, I never thought I'd have to build another ground. And then, obviously, Heysel, Hillsborough, you know, happened in Bradford. And it was, it was all waiting to happen, wasn't it? Uh, neglect, uh, uninvestment. No modern safety standards. It was it just an example. I mean, I, I, we had a game at York that I was terrified about. I, I was really terrified we'd lose life at a game in New York City. Um, so here we are with Lord Justice Taylor, who's a Newcastle man, but uh, did a tremendous job, and he's, it's law. You can't get a safety certificate if you don't have all the stadium. So we, we were got a dispensation because they agreed that Roker Park wasn't changeable. We went in the first division with Dennis. Uh, we sold out twice at 23,000. And when we had the job done about all seated, it came to 14,000. And that wasn't good enough, was it? So it, it was cost millions to do that. And we had a four-ended ground. We had the clock stand, wood, facing a terraced house. We had a crumbling concrete end, a, a grass mound, earth mound, and a very famous Archibald Lee stand. Yeah. That's what we had. Yeah. And there was no way. It was a no-brainer. But you did investigate that, didn't you? Oh, we went through And it. was it, I read in your book as yeah. well, there was a young George Clark was yeah, actually yeah. one of the architects who Yeah, well, well when, when we came back from the court case in London, we had to then open the ground and... We had to spend a million pounds before the start of the season to get a safety license by uh, changing aisles and reducing the capacity. And the 16-year-old George Clark turned up <laughs> from an art of Texas in Washington. Uh, and, and uh, yeah. So then you knew you had to find space for this new stadium for the people of Sunderland. Nissan, this yeah. near the site of Nissan was yeah, the first yeah, well, place, wasn't it? Was it was a great site if you wanted out of town. And uh, it was the Wembley of the North. And it was all funded by Europe. There was MEP at the time, a guy called Alan Donnelly. And he, and he we used to go to Brussels, Brussels quite often, and it was European money. That was what was going to do that. And then Nissan overnight went hostile because of their just-in-time deliveries. They rang number 10. and They I, took it as far as... No, they, well, yeah. they, they had a direct line into number 10. Nissan was that important. Uh, you know, they don't mess about. It uh, still is very important to the region. Oh, absolutely. Well. You know, and I'm not against Nissan. I, I made them shareholders of the club when I took the chair. And I got on very well with the chief exec, but the, the over, they went over hostile overnight. So I was left here with the Taylor Report at one hand, nowhere to go. And so I said to eminent people in the northeast, you know, what do you want to do with your football club? Yeah. What do you want to do with your football club? Because, uh, and... The chairman of Vaux at the time, Sir Paul Nicholson, uh, was also chairman of the Tainway Development Corporation. And they had a very good chief executive called Alistair Balls, a Scotsman. And uh, they undertook the on the sales to explore uh, Monk Weirmouth, which was closed. And I did a deal with the Tainway Development Corporation where they prepared the land. And, uh, and we put this magnificent stadium on it. Isn't there something quite romantic and full circle once again that your father worked down the pit at yeah. Silks with? Yeah, but yeah. the Sunderland, you know, the stadium is built on, it's literally built on the heritage of the city, isn't it? It is, yeah. And it's close to the city. I think it's a great location. Everybody can see it every day. Yeah, it's fantastic. And one of the things I've experienced while doing SAFC Unfiltered for the football club is speaking to a lot of the players, Sir Bob. And when I ask them about how, what made them come to the football club, they say, well, I'd look around the stadium. It's very nice, big. It was impressive. There was no one in there, but there's something special about it. And then I went to the Academy of Light, and it's as good as anywhere I've ever been. Yeah. How important was it that you 
made that happen as well. Well, it, it, obviously, when I came to the club, it had no infrastructure. I had no youth system. It didn't have any scouting system. It didn't have any medical. It just had nothing. And we had a field at Cleeton. And, uh, the Charlie Hurley uh, Centre? Yeah. Well, no, before that. Before that? There was a field uh, <laughs> on, the, on, on the roadside. And it, uh, that cha- um, and, and we, we had a field with two goalposts, no trees, no water. So the, the lads would have to go to the Roker Park yeah, they'd for go a shower? Yeah, go to Roker Park, get changed, drive down there, get muddy, they sit in their own cars, come back <laughs> and go in the bath. So match day was no special occasion. No. They were, that's where they were training. Right. So they had nothing. The Charlie Hurley I, I got, I bought the Charlie Hurley for the club. It was Bartram Sports Ground. Okay. And, and that was a, so that was a step up? That was a step up. We had porter cabins and a wow. nice surface and countryside and privacy. That was, that was a step up. But um, the, the academy, John Fickland, has to take a lot of credit for the, the operational side of it. What, what we did with the, the Charlie Hurley, um, we, we, we did a, a deal with Sky. They were, I chose them as our media partner. Uh, Man City did theirs. So they, they looked, you know, we're a Premiership club. They were looking for clubs to be permanent. And what they did is they bought equity for five percent of the new shares. We issued new shares, and they give us uh, twelve or thirteen million pound for these shares. And the the company got the money, and that started uh, the academy light because we'd bought the farm. You see, the Holmes family, a very intimate family, had a, a dairy uh, and a yogurt thing there. But they decided not to continue it, so we bought the whole farm, uh, and and we did that. And but it it works beautifully, mm-hmm. you know. The, the seniors are at one, the sunk underneath, the presser at one side. We, we we actually went to see Arsenal as well. Uh, we learned a lot from Arsenal, but uh, we took it a step further because we put mounds there and wind protections and. The pitch is the same as uh, the stadium light. And and did you learn from anecdotal responses that if you looked after the players, you would get better well, players common, and better performances? It's common sense, isn't it? Yeah. You know, like, if you, you know, it's common sense. Yeah. You, you know, you know we, I, I think, you know, we obviously got the stadium, but we need a, a, an educational place, don't we? I, th- I think the academy light's a very special place. Mm. It's a really special place, so near the city as well. Yeah. Uh, and I was really disappointed when, even after I'd left, I'd worked with Niall to get a plan permission for a full-size pitch there, mm-hmm. indoor, because we've got one at St George's, mm-hmm. and Alice Shaw just put a quarter one down, mm-hmm. which I, I think was really retro step. So we've got the basic size down there, but you could have put a full door down because we actually got a plan permission for it. But it has got it pretty much everything else down there, yeah, hasn't it? Has it? And it's really well respected. Yeah, and, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, it. Yeah, yeah it, that it, even makes it more why you would fail as a club when you've got that facility. And it's it's funny because the public don't really get to see it, do they? Really? No, they don't. So it's, it's, it's more about place. in the industry. Yeah, it, but it, 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 you know, it, it is top notch. You know, there's people come on and gone a bit further, it's like Man City, um, since then. But at the time, it was the best. Yeah, we can't have you on here without discussing the building which we're in right now, the Foundation of Light, Beacon of Light, a very imposing building which is right next to the Stadium of Light. And it's got a lot of importance, this building and the charity within it, hasn't it, Sir Bob? And it's all about inclusion, accessibility, and making the lives of people in Sunderland and Durham better, isn't it? It is, yeah. I mean, uh, I think, what do you think when you work for work for in it? I, I think it, it, you get the wow factor, don't you? You come yeah. in on the street level, as it's called, and you look up and think, wow, and then you think, oh, someone told me there's a football pitch on the top of this as well. So it, you, yeah. unless you come in and experience yeah. it... It's, it looks like a box, doesn't it? It does look like a box, and I like it yeah. on a match day when it's red and white as yeah, well. Yeah, it's well, wonderful. Like it. Yeah. So it is a wow factor. You yeah. hit the word, everybody comes in that door and goes, wow. Uh, and the 7,000 people a week come through it. Yeah. Plus we've got outreach centres. Mm-hmm. The trouble is it's needed. Yeah. It's needed more today. When, when I thought about this uh, in 2010 with Leslie, uh, you know, I, I never thought we'd have people come in here to get warm. Yeah. I find it really bad. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the situation we are in, I guess, because of the, the way that the state of players in the country right now. And it's a very important cause and one of the reasons why I ran the Great North Run for the Foundation of Light this year. Yes. You can thank me later for that. I'm still, still, still feeling the aches and pains of that, actually. But, um, yeah, it's a very important place. And 
it, to be situated so close next to the Stadium yeah, well, of Light as well, yeah, that's intentional. Yeah, well, that's uplifting, isn't it? Yeah. And to have the crest. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's it's a life changer. We save lives here, Frankie. We turn lives around. It's like a hospital, but it's good news hospital. It's a maternity ward. It brings good news. Mm-hmm. The vast number of times it changed people's lives. We've got 46 programmes living here. Yeah. It's inspiration, uplifting, and life changing. And there's accessibility for everyone, everyone here and inclusion, yeah, isn't everyone. it? I mean, does that come from your upbringing and maybe the people you saw in concert when you were a small child and you thought you saw people who maybe didn't have an outlet or a route into employment uh, yeah. or a route into education? So no, people that, still get left behind right now, they, don't they? Do they? I think most people just need a chance in life or a, a step up. You know, I was co-sponsor of Academy 360 at Pennywell, and I went up there last week to see the progress that's made, and it, it is coming on very good. Uh, you know, I'm a great believer in education. Uh, education changed my life. So um, it's it just it's, it's common sense, really. You know, I, it wasn't to get a knighthood. I had a knighthood before here, and it was, uh, you know, we, the, the concept came in 2010. Uh, and it's a really small piece of land, so the the architect was inspirational to come up with a building of this, like a street, on a, such a tiny piece of land. Uh, it was amazing, and the government gave me the land for a pound. Mm-hmm. You know that that because it was such a good scheme. Yeah. So yeah, it, it should it shouldn't be down a back street somewhere. It should be up proud because people can walk in and they can do this and then to see that and and literally anyone can walk in yeah, can't yeah, they can, can, yeah there's, there's no security system here yeah that's it's great on the edge, just walk in open door policy open door policy yeah yeah so it's good let's bring things back to football because yeah. you're a football fan you're a Sunderland fan yeah they're doing alright on the pitch at the moment aren't they yeah yeah yeah. exciting yeah. team to watch very exciting that uh, you know I've really enjoyed it since Carol's come through the door um, it's been uh, a really hard time for us fans since uh, Niall went really it's been a lost decade uh, we've had two really bad owners and we've all suffered for it uh, you know it's been really really difficult for us on a number of fronts I mean the foundation have struggled with the ownership issues uh, and the fact you know the club didn't put one penny into this building it's unthinkable isn't it uh, through the owners at the time but Mr. Louis Dreyfus is on board with the projects you've got going on and someone you speak to? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Kuro rang me before he took the club on. Uh, somebody had mentioned he showed interest in Sunland. Uh, so Kuro rang me uh, to ask me certain things. Uh, and we were on the phone about an hour and a half. Did you appreciate that? Oh, yes. I mean, what a great start. That it's somebody said you need if you before you go on to something you need to speak to Bob Murray, and I thought well good on you. So um, Carol's come in and uh, he's a trustee here. He gets it. He understands. He's a honorary owner of Sunderland Football Club for a certain limited time. Uh, he he's way beyond his years. Uh, 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 I went to his wedding in Venice. Me and Sue went a uh, three day wedding. Uh, there's only four of us went, Christian and his wife, who's had a recruitment, and me and so. Uh, what a lovely family. Uh, they've got a history of football. He's got, he knows what he's doing. He's determined to succeed. Obviously, he's made a lot of appointments. Recruitment is excellent. Uh, I, I really enjoy this team. I look forward to them. I, I think they're a great set of young lads. Um, they, they, you know, they're very together. They want, they're ambitious. Uh, they won't play for each other. They Did they get you off your seat when you watched them? They don't drop their heads. Yeah. They don't drop their heads. I mean, they're exa- exa- the perfect Sunderland team for me. Obviously, they're not Stefan Swartz or Claudia Rain or Kevin <laughs> Phillips, you know, but, uh, you know, they'll do for me. Yeah, they're very good. Uh, if things continue going the way they're going for Sunderland under Kirill Louis Dreyfus, where do you think Sunderland will be in 10 years' time? Well, you, you know, to fight country zone and football clubs and all the problems the game get with... Uh, I mean, can you imagine that the Premier League chairman got the sack for Newcastle becoming a change of ownership? I mean, can you imagine that? Or or, or whatever's going on. So we're, we're on a journey here. I mean, can you imagine that certain clubs thought they could break away recently? Yes. I mean, it's unthinkable, isn't it? 
Do you think that'll come again? Well, they'll have a go because it's about money. One way or the other, they'll, they'll have a go. But I, th I think it's the fact is, if you look at England, uh, there's 22 clubs in the league. And if you look at football clubs, Sunderland will be in the, one of those 22. Yeah, hopefully yeah. near the top end. Well, they'll be in a... Uh, you, you can't really play against countries, but uh, they'll, they'll be... In, they'll, you know, they will get back in the Premier League, I'm certain. It's just a matter of when. Uh, we're on a journey, and it's a, it's a nice journey. And we should just finish by mentioning the book again. I do it all again. Yeah. It's out now, and all the proceeds go into the foundation of yes, like That's right, isn't yeah. it? So, Bob Murray, thank you very much. Thank you, Frankie. Well, that's it for this edition of SAFC Unfiltered. We'll be back next week, I believe, with another very special edition of SAFC Unfiltered. And Danny will be back as well. So, until next time, we'll see you soon.